read a few of the things that are in her bio because it knocked my socks off. We're just so glad to have her here. She's got a BA in American History from Mary Baldwin University. And she's finishing a master's degree at Mary Baldwin in education slash psychology and history. She graduated magna cum laude and was inducted in the school's National Honor Society Phi Beta Kappa. She's currently teaching at the Hampshire County Schools still because we've just got a new job. And for the summer I'm working with um, the AmeriCorps Freedom Express. You've probably heard of that. It's a literacy program to keep children at grade level <coughs> throughout the summer. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good She's worked extensively in the field of education in Winchester, Virginia, and Frederick County, Virginia, specializing in gifted and talented art and music along with the academic and debate teams for 20 years. She graduated from the Hampshire County Schools and her family has lived in the Romney area for over 250 years. Brief, she's studying in, in Europe at Oxford University in the UK, concentrating on world and English history and on a scholarship and had has lectured to groups of professors on college. Yeah. So we are very fortunate tonight. Um, she's discovered some of our Romney history and the women who took a, a portion of our uh, Civil War glimpse and she's discovered it in some diaries and she's going to share that with us. So please help me welcome Louisa Bridges. Beautiful. Thank you, Mrs. Shaw, and thank you for the gift of your time. Um, much has been said and written about the Civil War, about the battles, about the commanders, but very little has really been written about what happened to people like you and I, the uh, middle class people that lived in the communities during the Civil War. The Civil War is very unique in that it was fought right here in our town. Many wars, uh, well, the war, most wars are fought, have been fought on foreign soil, but the Civil War was fought, of course, right here in um, our own country and right here in our own community. Uh, it's very interesting. We don't have a whole lot of... Um, diaries or journals about anybody who lived in Romney, except for we do have this book, which is called A Woman's Civil War. It's a diary and remembrance of the war from March 1862. Uh, it is written by Cornelia Peak McDonald. Cornelia Peak McDonald was Angus McDonald's wife. She came to um, Virginia as a child, she was born in Alexandria. Uh, she met her husband, Angus McDonald, when her family moved to Missouri. Her father was a physician, and her mother was very ill, and she died. Um, her older sister, Susan, married Angus McDonald's older brother, Edward. She moved to Romney. Um, they lived in the Davis House. Many of you all are familiar with the Davis House. Prior to uh, Cornelia living in the Davis House, Angus McDonald was, ma was married to Lacey Ann Naylor. And Lacey Ann and Angus McDonald had nine children. Uh, when um, Lacey Ann died, the children, of course, were left without a mother and Angus was 23 years older than Cornelia Peak McDonald. Um, I'll give you a list of the names of the children of Lacey Ann Naylor. Mary Naylor, Angus, Ann Sanford, Edward Hitchcock, William Naylor, Marshall, Craig Woodrow, Susan Lacey, and Flora. Can you imagine being a young woman Moving to Romney, West Virginia, and having nine children before uh, you even started having children yourself. And then Cornelia Peake McDonald had Harry Peake, Alan Lane, Humphrey Peake, Kenneth, 
Ellen, Roy, Donald, Hunter, and Elizabeth. Um, I would like to give you some background information on Angus McDonald because he's quite an interesting person. If you've never heard about him or studied him, you might find him a fascinating character um, because he was quite accomplished. Angus McDonald was a lawyer in our state. Uh, he also served in the 7th Virginia Cavalry during the Civil War. He became the superintendent overseeing the construction of the Northwest Turnpike with, um, a, and helped with the boundary dispute with Maryland. He was the grandson of a Virginia military officer and frontiersman, Angus McDonald, and the father of the fish commissioner, Marshall McDonald. Uh, Angus McDonald was from a Scottish clan, the McDonalds, and they were people that did not back down from a fight. Um, he was very much invested in the Virginia uh, cause of secession and had gone to Europe where he studied where were, there were different small states instead of a huge uh, continent. He thought, well, it might be better for the South to just secede. So he was much interested in the Virginia um, cause. Now, Cornelia, on the other hand, did not have any interest in her husband going to war. She did not believe in slavery. She found it uh, very troubling. Uh, she was uh, quite disturbed about it. Um, and so she was not in favor of the war. But her husband was quite uh, a military man. He had gone to West Point, and so he really did feel that the South should secede. And uh, on the night that he left, she was in complete despair uh, about her husband leaving. It's interesting that uh, Mr. McDonald uh, did not get along well with everyone in Romney. Not because he wasn't an honorable man, but because he had disputes with people over the way he handled the boundaries. So eventually the family did move on to Winchester, Virginia, but they did have a home in Kaiser uh, called Wen Lee, if you have ever heard of that. Um, he uh, was a very um, righteous man. He felt that, that um, the North, when it saw the South rise up, would back down. Of course, he was wrong, but in his mind, it was, it was a fight that was worth, worth fighting for. Uh, in those days, as you know, um, slavery was widely practiced. Whether, we, we all know that slavery is wrong. <coughs> But in, in those days, it was widely practiced, and people just felt that it was okay. So the South really needed slavery to go ahead and finish up their cash crops. They, that was the way they supported themselves. This is the way the South um, had to take care of its trading needs. The North, on the other hand, as you know, uh, did not feel that way. They felt that, that slavery was immoral. And of course, we all know today that they are right. Um, but this was a family that lived in Romney, and they are very um, divided in their thinking about it. I thought it was interesting. Uh, I'll give you some quotes from Cornelia McDonald as her husband is leaving in 1861. <coughs> On the night of March 11th, the pickets were in town. Part of the army had gone. They were hurried preparations and hasty farewell, farewells and sorrowful faces turning away from those they loved best. They were leaving us. Perhaps they were leaving us forever. At one o'clock, 
the long toll beat, and soon the heavy tramp of the marching columns died away in the distance. The rest of the night was spent in violent fits of weeping at the thought of being left. So this is how many of the women felt in our community. Uh, women at this time were not allowed to vote, so they were to send their, their young men, their husbands, off to a cause that maybe they didn't believe in, and yet they had no voice at this time. McDonald also goes on to write that she had men that surrounded her home. The union would come and surround her house. I would hear a step on the porch. My heart palpitated and it fluttered. In a way, I was so frightened. It was often long before I could quiet my heart's beating. I'm growing thin and emaciated from anxiety and deprivation of proper food, and I am weak, and now I have become even faint-hearted. So I fear that if I make many more demands, I must give up and leave it all, for I do not think I can much longer continue this struggle. Okay, here is the night in March. Her whole home is surrounded by soldiers. She finds out that her trees have been cut down to be used for firewood. She also finds out that the children uh, come to her and tell her that all the cows have been milked so that she doesn't have milk for her children. Now she has nine children and she has several sick children during this time. She goes into the town and she says every available place was turned into a hospital. The courthouse was now full. The banks, the banks were vacant and even the churches. I went from the courthouse and I saw dead men who were strewn. Some had papers pinned to their coats telling them who they were. All had the capes of their great coats turned over to hide their still dead faces. But their poor hands were so pitiful they looked so helpless. Busy hands they had been, some of them, but now their work was over. She decided that she would go and volunteer to be a nurse um, at this time to help with the uh, dreadful um, volumes of the wounded. Um, the hospitals were very primitive. This was before uh, germ theory and many of the nurses really did not know about keeping the hospitals clean. And so she decided that she would go in and volunteer. And she, she quotes, poor sufferers were there so dreadfully mutilated that I was completely overcome by their sight. I wanted somehow to be useful. I tried my best, but the sight of one face that a surgeon had uncovered, telling me that it must be washed, I thought that I should faint. It was that of a captain. He was from Tennessee. A ball had struck him on the side of his face, taking away both of his eyes and the bridge of his nose. It was a frightful spectacle. I soon as a surgeon explained to me why that he thought he might be saved and the poor fellow not aware of the awful sight his eyeless face was with the fearful wound still fresh and bleeding joined in the talk and raising in his hand he put his finger on his left temple and said oh oh I must have been struck there but the surgeon then asked me again if I could wash his wound. I tried to say yes, that I wanted to help. But the thought of it made me so faint that I could only stagger toward the door. As I passed, my dress brushed against a pile of amputated limbs heaping at the door. 
My faintness increased and I had to stop and lean against the wall to keep myself from fainting. Then another nurse stopped me on the way and asked me what was the matter. I told her about the poor man whose wound that I could not wash, and she said that she would take over. His name, she said, was Town. He was from Shepherdstown. He told me his wife's name over and over again. He thought that he might never see her. It seemed so dreadful to hear him say that. His wound, he shook. I begged him to let me hold his other hand, but he left this world and gave up. The regards of a dead man, there he was, so polite and such a gentleman. He said that he would love to hear some church prayers before he died, but there was no book in my hand, and it would have been impossible to read among those wounds and sounds of war all around me for all the amputations that were being performed in this room. So I ask you to think about this. How would you feel if you were one of these women? You knew that these men might be saved if you could help them, but if you didn't, what would happen? So she was really placed in a very unenviable position. Uh, it's interesting to note that it was about this time that historians believe that the women's movement began to take some form. Not because women were dissatisfied, but simply because there was such a great need for good nurses, doctors. Women uh, in our community used to go to only the eighth grade. And if your parents wanted to, they could send you on to several women's seminaries. There was uh, one in, Loudon, uh, in Winchester called Fort Loudon Seminary, and there was one in Charleston. But you really had to go away from your parents' home if you wanted to graduate from high school in Romney, if you were a girl in Romney at that time. Here's another note from her diary. One rainy afternoon, I was looking from my chamber window at the lovely fresh green grass and the dripping trees and thinking what a beautiful world it was and how I seemed to rejoice in the, freshing of the re refreshing of the rain. Then I heard a cavalry that wound through the cedars. They did not stop at the drive, but went over the grass in all directions. There were 1,500 horsemen who rode on to onto my grounds and dispersed themselves, tying their horses to the trees and pouring out grain for them to eat. As I looked, I saw that they were tearing the ornamental things off my house. A crowd soon collected around and the, ho the house and they demanded admittance. I told the children to close every door and to bolt it, to not answer the knocks or the calls, that no one must go to the door, but myself. For some time I took no notice of any knock or summons to open the door, but at last the calls became so imperative that I, fearing the front door would be broken into, went and opened it. I opened the door and saw three men holding another up between them. They requested permission to bring in a sick comrade. I suspected that this might be a trick, and I closed the door again. But soon another party came, more earnest and determined the, than the other. The horses had fallen down, and they had taken their horses, some of the horses, to the stable. It was no use to refuse permission. I was sure that they were, would have to come in, so I opened the door. There was confusion all over my house. The hall, the rooms, and even the kitchen was thronged. I took the children upstairs for fear of the soldiers. The next morning when I went down, I was determined to fix some breakfast for my children. My heart sank as I beheld the scene that awaited me down the stairs. There was mud, mud everywhere, all over everything. There was no color of, 
upon my carpets. Their great wet coats hung dripping on every chair and great pools of water under them. I went to the hall and looked out onto the lawn. I could not recognize it. It had been stripped of all the beautiful flowers. I turned from the right into the dining room and the, and the scene was irritating and wretched. Stretched on the lounge were lay men who had been hurt. The lounge was drawn close to the fire and seated around it with several more men. The kitchen was so full of men and all the food had been eaten. When I succeeded, I found the stove. It had been covered with pots, pans, kettles, and griddles, and every utensil. As I began to, to look closer, I saw there was nothing. No food was left. I had, I had nothing to give my children to eat. The children began to be starving. Um, eventually, the Union soldiers just completely took over her house. Uh, she left with only what she could take with her, uh, their clothes. Um, she went to Lexington to try to, to see her husband. Uh, of course, you know, in those days, um, there, there was no um, television. There wasn't any a reliable form of communication except for newspapers. And it was very hard to get word about her husband. So most of the time, she didn't know where her husband and her son were. Um, during this time, her uh, infant daughter did die, and she did have to bury her. She also found that uh, her, her stepson was killed in the Civil War. Um, she talks about a man from Hampshire County, and I thought that was rather interesting. There was a man from Hampshire County. He was a farmer's son, a member of one of our own. He was dressed in a beautiful new uniform. It was gray and buff. He had on a splendid red silk scarf around his waist, and his sword was by his side. He was very tall and slender, with regular features and dark hair. His face was noble looking, and he must have been a very handsome man. But now he was dead. I took one of his hands, his small white hands, and held it in my own. It was still warm, and it was difficult to believe that he was not asleep. No wound could be seen, and not a drop of blood stained his clothing. This poor young soldier from Hampshire County, who, who watched over him, his mother, I'm sure she would weep as she saw him, his, his weak and dead body, his long jet back, black beard. He was the major of his regiment, they said, and shot while leading his own men. Um, Angus MacDonald, um, her husband, was eventually taken to prison and became very ill while in prison. He was treated very cruelly. Um, she decided that she would try to go see him um, in Richmond. Uh, she was so excited to see him. She was just couldn't wait because she hadn't had a chance to see him in a long time. She hadn't heard anything about him. And so she went to Richmond and went into the hospital room and there he was dead. He had just died the night before. She had not gotten to say goodbye to him. She had not gotten to tell him that she loved him. Um, he was he was older than she was and he was in his probably in his 50s. And can you imagine, you know, being in your 50s and he's riding around uh, over miles and miles of wilderness uh, trying to defend his country. He just truthfully wasn't up to it. It says that he um, had rheumatism, so he was in a lot of pain, and I'm sure uh, they really didn't know specifically uh, what to do. She also found that her brother-in-law, Edward, was also killed in the Civil War. And there she was, a widow, with um, not 18 children, but with 17 children now a widow. She found that all her Confederate money was worthless. Uh, she had no house. She had no money. She had no marketable skills. She had 17 children who 
really uh, could not support themselves. And so she was, it was upon these conditions that she found a friend, some friends from Romney, who came to see her. And I think it's rather fascinating that uh, a man, a Presbyterian minister named Dr. Foote, came to see her. I don't know if anybody here has heard of that name. Have you? So he, she talks about how kind it was of Dr. Foote to come all the way to Richmond, uh, to, all the way to Lexington to see her and to comfort her at that time. And also the Dailies. I don't know if you're familiar with the Dr. Daly. Have you heard of that name? She comments about Dr. Daly. It's interesting. I believe that Dr. Daly um, built the house that is actually behind this building. Is that correct? He did. Dr. Daly. The Daly House. Okay. Um, she didn't really know what to do. Um, several of her friends came to her and said, you know, the children really should be taken away from you and put in homes where they can be supported. But this was so um, heartrending to her that she she just couldn't imagine doing it. Louisa? Yes. How, excuse me, how old was she then at this time? She probably was in her 40s at this time. Um, she says that I had many kind friends in Lexington who knew me and they sent me in everything they could. They did what they could, they did what they could but truthfully, she, she quotes in her book that she was starving. Um, she was starving and her children were starving. Um, there, were, there really wasn't any organization to help people that, had, that were in these types of circumstances. Um, so, fortunately for her, uh, there was an organization that formed uh, for Confederate widows, and they um, did find ways to give her money and food. She did eventually move to Kentucky, and um, her children describe the, the home that they had as a very pleasant home. Um, she went on to pull herself up by her bootstraps, I suppose, and she became a writer and an artist, and she um, sold her writings and was able to make um, some living in that way. Uh, it's a fascinating book. I hope you will, will um, read it. I think you will find it very interesting, particularly with its references to Romney. It's the only book that I know of that has someone that has talked about um, Romney during the Civil War. So with that, I'll end that. And I decided it would be interesting for us to think about um, how women have changed Romney. We, we can't take away from what all the men have done. They've been very virtuous and courageous and we're grateful and indebted to the men of our community. But there have been some significant women at, um, in our community that have helped us along the way. And I would like to uh, just honor some of them by uh, calling them out. Um, the first female First Lady was Mrs. Edna Brady Cornwell. Um, the first um, principal of the School for the Deaf and Blind was Mrs. Margaret Hopkins Keller. Some of these pictures are along the wall, so you might have a good time in as you um, get something more to eat looking at them. Um, I also think uh, Madeline Blue was uh, on the first National Board of Education. Um, the first um, female entrepreneur that I know was Mrs. Sipple. She owned the New Century Hotel in the early uh, 1900s. Eleanor Roosevelt visited Romney. She was um, an excellent um, hostess and um, so she is quite uh, outstanding. 
Um, the first female mayor, of course, you know, is Mrs. Beverly Cadle. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we can be very grateful for her. Um, Ray Ellen Scanlon uh, is the first teacher, national teacher, um, of the year. And of course, she is from Romney and graduated from Romney Schools. Um, the first female vet, I believe, is Ruth Ann Whiteman. Uh, the first female psychiatrist, I believe, is Linda Jane Haynes. Um, the first female um, pharmacist is Laura Stump. Um, we have several entrepreneurs in our midst. Um, Mrs. Anderson, of course. And we also have um, Mrs. Dillon was going to come, but she had, um, I think, had a dental problem. Um, I would like to add to this list um, the first editor of the Hampshire Review was um, a female, and that was um, uh, Margaret Inskip Keller of the Keller Hotel. And let's see, the first director of mental health was Izzy Miller. Um, trying to think of the first female attorney, I believe, is that Julie Millicent? Frazier? That's what I thought. Um, the first superintendent of the School for the Deaf and Blind is, is that um, Mrs. Well, she's a she was a Woods. She's now, um, I'm trying to think of her last name. I'm sorry, she just married. Um, perhaps you can help me with some of these. Mrs. Daskal and um, O'Brien is was the first. Were you the first assistant superintendent of the schools? Superintendent of the schools. Isn't that exciting that we have women that have been so accomplished? I, it's funny. I work in the school system, and often the girls will tell me that they don't have any aspirations or dreams or plans for the future. And I, I try to tell them people in their midst that have done amazing things. Um, I'm trying to think about any... I think Julia Blue was probably the first female that, veterinarian. Oh, so then that would be... I'm okay. just guessing. I don't know of another female before her. I don't, I don't either. Now, I think your mother, wasn't your mother the first woman on the city council? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yes, she was. That's what we were talking about. It's hard to find this information, but... Um, if you if you would help me at the end of the meeting, I would like to compose a list, and maybe we could uh, have it um, put in the newspaper. So I don't know of any. Uh, I know as far as authors, uh, Anne Pancake and Jenna Loy um, are the first authors that I know that are women. Mary Kirkendall Weber. Mary Kirkendall Weber. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a blessing to be with you. Um, I've enjoyed it. I hope you will go to some of the tables and see some of the pictures. There are pictures of the, um, the academy, the girls' academy. There are pictures of um, the Potomac Academy. And I think you will find... Um, the picture is very interesting. Here's a picture of Margaret Hopkins Keller, and she lived in the house that I live in. Um, she was the first uh, principal of the school for the deaf and blind. So I think you'll find these pictures interesting. Thank you. Could you speak on the mic, please, Lisa? I think I turned it off. The Potomac Academy. Yeah, but did you come up here? No, I'll stay right where I am. People won't be able to say. No, but you, 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 can, re you can repeat the question. She's going to tell. 
Okay, the question was, can you tell me more about the Potomac Academy? And I have to defer to my aunt uh, can tell you more about the Potomac Academy. Potomac Academy was a school of the Presbyterian Church. And that's about all I know about, really. <laughs> and it was uh, open about 1849, I think, or 50, and operated until all oh, about 19, probably about 1912 uh, or 14. <coughs> And then uh, public school. Finally, there was a a, a public high a public school. The, the public school began to take hold in the situation in this uh, community. I don't really know uh, where you would go to school in Romney if you didn't go to the Potomac Academy. It was here. Tonight. Yes, it was. It was the this oh, building of the School for the Blind. Oh. That building is still there, and that. Oops. That was the Potomac Academy. Okay. How many did it graduate? Like, uh, was it like every year? Or? Well, no, it only went. The schools were not graded in those days the way they are now. I think they probably hear me. My voice. No, we, uh, it has to. We has to be on the mic in order to be on the on the video. Oh, I see. Uh, you were asking how many were graduated. Mm -hmm from the Potomac Academy? I don't know. Schools were not graded in those days just the way they are now. Okay. So um, I, I don't know how many they graduated, but uh, their schooling would have gone to about what we would say would be the eighth grade. And uh, you could, uh, our children from Romney went there, but also it was a boarding school, so children from other places came. Now where they lived, I don't know, but the school building was that middle building over there at the School for the Blind. They, when the School for the Blind opened there, they used that building and it's still there. I have a picture of it. Oh, do you? Yes. It's oh, it's over there. And well, anyway, it was, a, it was an elementary school. That was private, so people had to pay? Oh, yes, you had to pay to go there. Now, I don't know where children went if they couldn't go to the academy. It's, I guess they, they must have had public schools. They surely did. But I think... Uh, there was one up on um, Grafton Street. Yes, that was a public middle. school. Was, was that the Potomac Academy in later years? No, the Potomac Academy was only over in that one building there. And then finally the public school became a, a factor in the community, so there was no longer any reason to operate the academy. But there was no high school until 1970. So if you wanted to go to high school, you had to go someplace. You had to go to a boarding school and go out of town. So it wasn't just for women, though? Oh, no. The, the, everybody went to the academy. Uh, I think I have a photograph, a postcard of it, and I, it seems to me it has a picture of an eye and the eve. One eye. <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh, I need to go pull that picture of a private or private Oh, well, anyway, it was it was owned and operated with Presbyterian Church. So it was a, a actually it was a parochial school. Where was that hotel? Beg your pardon. The hotel. Right here. You're sitting on. We're we're sitting on. New Century Hotel. Keller Hotel, the Century Hotel, the New Century Hotel was here. Mm -hmm. And before any of the of those was the Armstrong Hotel. The Armstrongs uh, were a very early family, and they had a hotel at the very beginning of the town. Wasn't there a Parker Hotel? Yes, but it was down the other end of town. Was big enough to support two hotels. Well, I guess I guess it must have been. <laughs> we 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 were cleaning out some stuff, Pam and I, this week, and um, we came across a book. It was an original book from 1914. Um, that was from uh, the park, the Parker House, and inside it they had uh, receipts for you know, hotels and some places. One of them actually has written on a hand from like 1911, the Sheets Hotel. Sheets Hotel. Sheets House. Sheets 
Sheets House. Sheets House. And um, it was quite an interesting thing to see because it had for tobacco and, and, and We would love to request a copy of that. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be the original like you have, but, you know, just maybe even take a digital picture that Charlie Hall would put up on. You know, just save it for austerity. Mm -hmm. You think about it. All the things that tie in history is just amazing. <laughs> so, I think the doctor could have something to do with that. Oh, I'm sure he's he probably here when when it opens. But he probably had a great deal to do with it. He also had something to do with literary hall. And but he was the Presbyterian minister. Yeah. Now. And the the reception room at the Presbyterian Church is named for his daughter Mary Bell. And she was a teacher for many many years. There were two schools that were on what's. The schools for the deaf and the blind. The Tumblr Academy is what became what we know now is like the last use of it was the dining hall of the but you had the Romney Classical Institute too, which is where the administration is well it's grown and you can hardly recognize it, but it's part of the administration building. The main one that you see as you're yeah, coming there were out. two there were two schools there. I think the Potomac Academy and the Romney Classical Institute. Louisa? Yeah. Uh, back to Angus for a minute. Uh, military man, correct? Yes. Did he have any other occupation prior to the Civil War? Was he a farmer? He was a lawyer. Lawyer, okay. And he married the daughter of a lawyer who was also a lawyer. Okay. The first one, yes. Um, so he was married twice? He was married twice. Well, which house did you say they lived in? That they they lived in the Davis house. Lacey Ann Naylor and Angus McDonald lived in the Davis house, as well as Cornelia. So that was the home that was trashed by the soldiers. Yes. That had 18 children in that house. Upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this some of them must have been grown. <laughs> Right. Well, all children. Well, well, you're right, they weren't all children at once. And then also the McDonald's did move to Wind Lee, which was near Could you speak New on Creek. Oh. McDonald's also moved to Wind Lee, which was near New Creek or Kaiser. And then um, they uh, also moved to Winchester. When she was talking about um, all of the soldiers being on her land, covering all of her land, she said 1,500 on it. Was there more land that went with the Davis house, or was she maybe living? She was living in Winchester, Winchester when she was describing that. And you know, I'm confused as what prompted her? Did she have family there? Was she able to? Still have enough money to purchase a house there? Or? Um, she completely, after the Civil War, uh, she completely lost the house. Of course, in the middle of the Civil War, they took over her house. The I mean, how did she get the house near Winchester? Uh, Angus McDonald and Cornelia moved to Winchester, oh, okay. and he be then began to practice law in Winchester. Before the war? Before the war. Okay, gotcha. And she had all these children at the Davis house? She had, it said that she had all the children at the Davis house. That is the only um, thing that I know about that. It may be... It be a full house. It <laughs> must have been. You know, we were talking about that, and we were saying, how on earth did she handle that? I don't know how she well, handled it. Well, some of them were grown. They weren't all there at the same time. Eighteen children and not all the children at once. And also, I think they probably, more than one, were in the beds 
don't you think? <laughs> Maybe two children in a bed? Did they, was, did people sleep like that? And I mean, well, I don't know. I wasn't there, but I expect they did. Well, I, I don't know either. That's something I don't know. I can't answer that. We suspect four or five shared a bed. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if they could, it's better than the floor. I'm sorry. Questions? Comments? Maybe it's a bit of trivia, which I like to share with people that has uh, indirect uh, tie to Romney, West Virginia, is um, regarding uh, a woman who lives in Romney, Genevieve Heatwell. Her mother was born uh, when William McKinley was president, uh, probably 1898-99. She lived to be 105 years old. She vote, voted in 1921. She turned 21 and when women, first time she could vote in 1921, when women had to vote, she was able to vote in every election thereafter. And several years before her death, she was constantly recognized as one of the last remaining women in the United States who voted in the first election when women uh, received the vote. So um, that's uh, Jenny's uh, mother, so she does have uh, an indirect link. Now, if any of you have ever been um, to the Women's Right Museum in Seneca Falls, New York, I'm sure you've enjoyed it. It's my favorite museum, and if you ever have a chance to it's a little bit out of the way, go up there. It's really impressive. I would love to see it. Oh, it's, it's fabulous. <laughs> Well, we've been uh, researching um, the Keller Hotel, and we found several presidents came to Romney. Uh, William McKinley signed in on the uh, the uh, guest book, and Grover Cleveland. Um, the, who was the temperance worker? Oh, Terry Nation. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Yes. That should put us on the map, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Also, I believe why Eleanor Roosevelt uh, stayed at the hotel here. Uh, if any of you have ever traveled to Arthurdale in Preston County, you know, that's where one of the, uh, what were they called, the planned communities, <laughs> that, that was her baby, you know, and this was a stopover for her here. And I'm um, <clears throat> that's a really interesting place if you have an opportunity to go, to go there and, and go through that community. And um, uh, two important things was uh, she always traveled by herself. <laughs> they said she would, would leave the, you know, the president in the White House and she'd put a, a rifle in the back of the car and she would drive herself. Yeah. And she loved to stop here, and she loved to go to Arthurdale, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and and be with the people there, you know, because you know that that was her project. Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I do day trips; it's kind of like hobby by find where we can go. Mm -hmm. And so about this has to do with history in our own journey. Oh, probably about five years ago, we decided to go to Arthurdale, and. Um, they have uh, an area because they had they had their own community. They had everything there. They, they, that's what they were trying to do. So they had their own school. Yep. And I went into the museum uh, because that they had a lot of things about the school that was there. Mm -hmm. And I had once taught yeah. Preston County, and my supervisors were um, I were like in their 60s or 70s at the time. And I thought, well, I bet you some of them are going to build. Their pictures. So I'm walking along looking at pictures, and who do I see but Robert Calvert's yes. picture so I'm there on the wall. And he had been the, I think, the vice principal and guidance counselor in that school there. Wow. So that, that was very interesting and relating back to, to uh, our own county. Right. She's right. Um, we went to that museum also and saw Mr. Calvert's picture on there, and he. Um, he was wooed away from that school to come to be principal in uh, Hampshire County. So also a connection, secondary connection there. 
there used to be a map on the old school board office of all the one-room schoolhouses in Hampshire mm -hmm. County. How far back did that go? Did that say really? Do you know? I, I don't I don't remember that. Yeah. But I thought that. there are people in the county here telling yeah. you that. Yeah, didn't I we have a copy too. Gerald Mathias did the research on that for the Hampshire 250 project. And he would be a good person to invite here to talk about that. That would be very interesting. Because there are know, just when, hundreds of them. the bottom corner of that. Right. Yeah. You know, a lot of one of the traditions I always heard is you know the Potomac Academy, you know, the Presbyterian Church were used as hospitals in the Civil War. So where did all the wounded come from? Or were they really even wounded from battle, or were these just sick soldiers because there would have been so much illness? I can can only say that I think that there were wounded. Um, it was a very bloody war. Um, I don't know about the sick soldiers. Uh, Angus MacDonald was an elderly person toward the end of the war, and he just was very ill, so he ended up not being able to finish fighting the war. That would be something interesting to research. We could, we could go through and try to research the hospitals. Which house was used as a hospital in the Civil War in our town, do you know? The Presbyterian Church was, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. The Potomac Academy. And the Potomac Academy as well. Was um, the boxwood used? I don't know. I think my history says that, but I can't tell. Was it her hospital? Was it your house used for a hospital? So the hospital that you spoke of was in Winchester? We had she, had that she was trying to help out? Yes. Well, there were so many battles in the Shenandoah Valley that, you know, I mean, those that were fought and you know, people was not that far, you know, all that up and down. And, you know, the Shenandoah Valley, they, they probably just transferred those people to central locations and, you know, away from where the battles were. Did you have a question? Uh, a clarification. Um, the Civil War, so many, so many men died fighting the Civil War that more men to this day died fighting in the Civil War than in every other war the United States has had all, all the way from 1775 to the present. I was not aware of that. I, I definitely knew it was a bloody war. I don't know the exact figures. I bet we could, we could find that out. Because there weren't really many battles around here, it's uh, hard to know whether they, the people who were wounded came back home, you know, and tried to get help. But so the, the passage that you were saying where there were limbs that she brushed her skirt against, that was in Winchester? That was in Winchester. Because there were so much more fighting in that area, yeah, in Curtis Town. Yeah, there were mostly skirmishes around here, so there wouldn't have been that many casualties at any one time. A lot of nursing, uh, if you study the history of nursing, um, it, it, it became uh, so much more uh, a field for women during the Civil War. And they learned so much about how to care for wounded uh, veterans by using, you know,
clean hospitals. They also began to emphasize uh, mental health at that time because they realized these men um, were had uh, what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder and they needed places to go to recover and they didn't understand that. They, had, they would put them in like cages and prisons and because they really didn't know what to do with um, people that had mental health issues at that time. So it did change history in that way. It's interesting to know that I don't think that as a country, if the South had won, we would be the country that we are, and the history would definitely have been changed because you know, the United States has been such a leader in our world and the other wars. Were there many slave owners around here? Unfortunately, yes, there were. A lot more than you would probably think. Yes. What did they... You look at that 1860 slave schedule, and I was looked at it not long ago, and I was surprised because I'd always been really told when I was younger that uh, there were small farms and there weren't many slaves. And look at that, and I think it worked out about uh, one in 12 inhabitants in Hatcher County was a slave. And they were concentrated up and down the South Branch River and over on Patterson's Creek. So they used them on the farms for farming? Yeah, yes, and there was a couple of slave traders in the area too as well. So. But another historical farm. One farm in particular down uh, had 20 slaves, which is an amazing number, I think. It was generally just a few per household. But, yeah. um, mm. The, the uh, stereotypical big plantation with a whole bunch of slaves, some of that in some places was going on, but the average slave owner had one slave. Because the other historical tidbit that's trivia that's interesting is, of course, this county supposedly so traditional Confederate. And yet, at the time that we became West Virginia, of course, Mineral County was part of Hampshire then too, but over 50% voted to join West Virginia and were Union sympathizers. It's the fact that the educated landowners were the Confederate, and they write the history. There was only, which there was makes, only two precincts open, and they were over another part of the yeah, county but, too. But, it makes, <laughs> but because of who, wrote the, who the educated wrote the history, it makes it seem more Confederate sympathizers than was really here. I mean, that's true. I mean, Alabama, North Carolina, even over half of the people there were really Union sympathizers. But the landowners who controlled things were the Confederate sympathizers. So That's uh, true. Um, I'll show you this picture. Mrs. Shaw, I know, has a picture of um, my aunt. This is Aunt Tidy, and she supposedly... Um, was put in her skirt a message, uh, in the hem of her skirt, a message she rode to Winchester just to try to notify uh, Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, that Romney was, was uh, had been taken over by the Union. So she... Uh, but they were coming around, Mike knows, Story. Yeah, she actually wrote to Charlestown. She wrote she, to Charlestown. She and her sister. Now this is this is um, suppose this is my my aunt's aunt Tiny. Right. She and her sister rode from our farm, the Washington Bottom Farm, to Charlestown, and they didn't take Route 50 either. They went through <laughs> fields and they knew the way. How long do you think it took them to get to Charlestown from Springfield? A couple weeks. Anybody want to guess? I don't know. Two days. Oh my goodness. Now, were they in their 20s when they yes. did? Yes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, because she was born in 1841. That's right. And this was, she was about 20 years old. Louisa? Yes. Approximately 620,000 soldiers died from combat, accident, starvation, and disease during the Civil War. And a lot of them, a lot of the deaths were from disease because yes. 
they piled all these men together who didn't have any immunities from a lot of diseases they were being um, More men died from disease. I think so. Uh, if you go to the Civil War Medicine Museum in Frederick, Frederick Maryland. Frederick, Maryland, it's very interesting. I would, I've been to Antietam, and, but I would love to go to see that museum. That's well worth it. Is it? Yes. That would be You fancy. follow a, a one soldier through the war. Oh, as you go that would be so it's interesting. It's very nice. In Frederick, Maryland? Frederick, Frederick Maryland, yes. Civil War uh, Medicine. That whole topic, you could just do a whole study on that whole topic, how medicine changed. They, they really didn't know how to help the men. You know, the surgeons, they were doing the best they could. It was very primitive. Well, they knew that if they cut the limb off it, they were more likely to survive than if they tried to treat the wound. I mean, but still, they, the infections... Right, that was why, because it would get infected so deeply. <clears throat> well, this has been wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, it's, it's so much fun. Up here now. <laughs> <laughs> this is my Aunt Louisa, and she taught in the public schools here in Hampshire County for 35 years. Oh, wow. right. <laughs> and she gave a talk on the Keller Hotel at another time, so... She knows so much she's, history. Oh, she's a veteran. Yes. Oh, Louisa, is that book in the library? No. This is a, this book. It's hard to get a hold of. I'll be glad to lend it to you. Would you like to read it? A woman, a woman's civil war diary. Diary. Okay.